class. With this lecture, we are going to look at social psychology, and basically we're just looking at how we form our perceptions of ourselves compared to how we see others and then how they impress on our thoughts, emotions, and behaviors. So when we're looking at social psychology, we're looking at how individuals behave, think, and feel in social interaction. So it's pretty much how we engage each other when we're all together in a group, right? And it can be either, you know, one-on-one -on -one engagements or more than one person you're engaging with. A lot of how we behave socially comes from our culture. So those cultures are those, uh, those patterns, those traditions, those ways of life that uh, we have that are passed down from generation to generation. And culture plays a big part in how we form our identities and our sense of self. A lot of times when we look at how we fit into the uh, social group, we tend to form, uh, well, we tend to group ourselves off. And uh, most of the time we form these in-groups and these out-groups. The in-groups are the ones, of course, that we identify with more. Those are individuals that, that we feel are more similar to us think in the same ways as us, maybe even look more like us, and then of course that out group is going to be anybody that you don't identify with, anybody that is different, and uh, that's kind of where the problems with social engagement come into play, because when we start grouping people into in and out groups, we, we see conflict, because the out group is always labeled as a bad thing, and so that's where we see things like prejudice, discrimination, and stereotypes typing come in and all of those are over generalizations exaggerations of just how people really are and so it's really a bad thing you know when it comes down to being human and engaging you know engaging each other socially it's okay to have those similarities, but we also need that diversity too so you know limiting ourselves to just these two types of groupings just that. It limits all of our potential and our ability to uh, thrive and succeed in life. So we have to be really careful about how we classify and group people. And then, of course, a lot of how we form our opinions about ourselves and others comes from our attitudes and beliefs. And basically, attitude, attitude is, it's not like our moods or our emotions or our uh, temperance, even though we kind of use attitude to uh, describe those uh, characteristics of personality. Attitude is kind of just that way that we respond bond to people so it could be you know positive or negative ways and a lot of our attitude has to do with our belief system so you know how we perceive a situation how we perceive others and then of course there's that emotional side to it so you know that's where the attitude can be positive or negative because the way we're going to respond to a situation is going to have emotional component because we are human beings and we have emotions and so that's why we always want to work on you know having those emotions in life that are more serving to us you know yes life is not all unicorns and rainbows and we're never going to get away from negativity never going to get away from conflict but we can you know uh, uh, alter the way that we respond to those things and then that's what helps lessen those in our life and then, and, and you know, taking some of that pressure off of there, that's then how, how we create that balance and uh, kind of adjust to our lives better, right? <clears throat> and then lastly, a lot of our attitudes are just formed on our behavior. So just uh, not only how we respond to people, but how we have gotten feedback from people in situations. So all of that just affects that general overall just way that we feel and way that we act. That would probably be a good way to uh, talk about or our, our, our define our attitudes. All right, and so, and then just looking at how our attitudes form, you know, once again, it's kind of like our temperaments. It's something that, that forms, you know, early in our development. It's something that's influenced by our caregivers, our family members, and then, you know, the people in our immediate social circles. 
And then a lot of the time, like I said, it's, it's that action component of attitude formation. So it's just that experience, that direct contact. So basically, you know, <coughs> excuse me. How people respond to the way we act conditions us then to uh, respond, you know, to, to how then we go about responding to different people and different experiences. And, you know, once again, and we always kind of want to uh, take that moment of mindfulness and, and, and assessing our present situation so that we don't put our past biases and experiences on new situations even if it you know looks very similar to something we've been through you know you're, you're approaching somebody that's different from you and maybe you've had a bad experience with that person and you know that type of person in the past you can't put that on to your present situations we have to try and to experience each person in each situation in each day as a new opportunity, you know, for learning and growing. And when we don't do that, that's when we get stuck in those rigid mindsets. And that's when we let things like prejudice and discrimination and stereotyping bias us in our engagements with others. <clears throat> And in thinking of that, too, we have to be really careful. We live in a time where, uh, you know, we have so much technology and we have social media that it's really easy for us to, to you know, really pull back from others and, and uh, separate ourselves into our little in-groups. And, you know, like I said, it's not necessarily a bad thing. You know, it becomes a bad thing, though, when, when that's all that we allow to influence us. So, you know, if we're, let's just say we, we just watch Fox News or we just watch CNN and, 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 you know, we're like, well, Fox News is right and CNN is bad or, you know, we believe in Protestant uh, religious uh, and belief systems and people over here are Muslim they're bad they you know they're wrong you see when we do that you know we really and we're not just you know putting negativity off onto others you know for the most part we're holding that negativity inside ourselves and like I said you know it just it doesn't do us any good as individuals and it certainly doesn't do us any good as the collective so we have to <coughs> So right there, that last bullet point, we have to make sure that we have those personal world view. Uh, we have those personal views of the world, and then we have those world views. You know what we think of others. We have to, you know, try to keep those. Uh, and more of those positive and serving ways. You know, we just can't view everybody in our outgroup as dangerous, threatening, or bad, you know, because that, that's where those stereotypes and prejudice come into play. Just like we don't want someone to look at us and go, oh, well, you know, start stereotyping and, and uh, you know, who they think that we are. We don't want to do that to other people. And it's really easy to stay stuck on that very basic level and especially when it comes to the media and listen you know the media stays on a very basic level they use a lot of emotional rhetoric and a lot of fallacies of and thinking to kind of you know just that to appeal to our emotional sides and and a lot of time it's a it can be very fear based and and you know like I said life is not all unicorns and rainbows but at the same time we can't run around living in fear of life all the time because as bad as life can be there's some really great wonderful and beautiful things about it too and when we keep ourselves locked in those rigid mindsets when we keep when you know when we don't widen out our in-group to include others you know it's just uh, like I said it just hurts our potential to self-actualize and you know that just hurts us as a species there because it's through our innovations and our creativity and our uh, uh, willingness to engage each other is how we have evolved over the years and so you know we just want to be mindful of that as as we uh, develop along our paths in our lives and we find those best ways to help uh, balance everything else so that we are well adjusted individuals and citizens all right, so sometimes when it comes into to our attitude, you know, the way that we respond to situations, it may not always be reflected in our behavior. So we may not always act with the way that, that our kind of attitude, you know, the way that we are feeling inside. And sometimes that has to do with the immediate consequences, you know, maybe, uh, uh, say, 
right there, your, your attitude, you have a bad attitude and, and you're going to go to snap at your kids or maybe snap at your, your spouse, your mate and, and you know that would be like the wrong thing to do in that situation because then you're, you know, you're doing that Freudian projection thing to where you're projecting your anger and negativity onto somebody that's not deserving of it. So, you know, so some, sometimes we, we tend to act out on that, but you know, it's best to once again be mindful of our attitudes and our actions and our emotional state so that we you know we don't create that unnecessary conflict in life because conflict does exist in life but for the most part a lot of it we just uh, tend to you know unnecessarily create and i think a lot of that just has to do with that fact of you know we're just so overwhelmed by 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 just the technology and social media and and the way that we live society it's so fast paced and very overstimulating to us so you know that that tends to have an effect on our attitudes and our our personalities and just generally how we feel in life right and at the same time, you know, when we're more mindful of those types of things, when we take those moments to kind of slow down and, and just think for a minute about what we're going to say, what we're going to do, or how we feel about something, you know, it can really change the way a situation goes. And remember, we can't change how somebody else is going to act in the situation. We can only change how we act and then use that as the positive example for others. And sometimes we don't act the way that we are feeling because, uh, you know, we're, we're, uh, a f we're afraid of how others are going to judge us for it. And then at the same time, it's because of those expectations because we want to, you know, comply. We want to conform with the group. So we're going to be behaving in a way that is acceptable to the group. And then sometimes it's just habit. It's just the way that we have now, you know, we have, life has shaped us. That's a good way to say it, you know, based on our experiences and our development. We've just been shaped into having these particular attitudes and behaviors. And, you know, they can be difficult to change, but we have to remember, you know, as human beings, we are capable of learning, you know, everything that basically we know, we've been learned, right? <laughs> That's bad grammar. We've been taught everything that we know. And uh, so we have that saying, it's like, oh, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Not true. We are totally capable of relearning our behaviors, uh, learning, relearning how to deal with our our thoughts and our emotions. I think the key with that, though, is motivation. You know, to get somebody else to change, they have to be willing and motivated to change. So, so definitely some operate conditioning and just social learning theory going on with all of those ideas, right? So think about like Skinner and Bandera and those other cats. <clears throat> And then lastly, sometimes our convictions, you know, sometimes we have, once again, you know, if we stay stuck in that rigid mind state, we can become so convinced and so passionate about something that we're more likely to act upon that or, or not act upon that. And, you know, once again, that's where we have to be careful of, uh, you know, just what just just you know once again that balance in life you know we have to be careful of how we pick and choose of how we act and how we decide to present ourselves to others because you know we want acceptance and we want to fit into the group but at the same time we don't want to compromise who we are and what we believe in and our own sense of morality just to you know just to appeal to other people that's when we start running into those dangerous things and that's when we start seeing you know groups of people getting picked on so you know slavery genocide you know all of those events like that has something to do with the way people's attitudes are and the way society has ingrained taught them to think and behave around things that are different from them so you know sometimes we can be passionate about something and it's a good thing and then sometimes we can be passionate about something and it's not necessarily correct it would be like some uh, like arguing about religion or politics the two things they tell us never to argue about why it's because people have very strong convictions about those things and and you know they they're likely to lead to more arguments because they're so emotionally charged right that's a lot of political 
ideology and political espousing has to just do with, you know, getting us emotionally charged and, you know, why? Who knows? But uh, that's kind of how it is. And so, and like I said, sometimes that's a good thing, but sometimes it's bad because, you know, if you're just going to get passionate because you just want to argue with somebody, that that's really not the point of, of, you know, social behavior and engaging with each other. Yes, we're not always going to agree on something, but, but you know, we can have positive discord where we don't agree with each other you know it just comes down to identifying um, what our attitudes and behaviors are and once again you know trying to be persuasive and convince the other people or, or that uh, you know the other party of what we're saying and, and at the same time we have to understand that no matter how convicted and passionate we are about something it may not necessarily be somebody else's, you know, cup of tea, and so, and so you know, in that we have, and in that passion, once again, we have to realize that we can't change others, and you know, it's okay to be compassionate about something, but you know, in our passion for for whatever that something is, and and as bad as we want somebody else to understand and be that passionate. We have to, you know, extend that to that other party too and understand that they may not be and not get upset if they're not, you know. That's where we find those new ways of engaging and, and uh, trying to find that understanding and trying to listen to the other side so that, you know, we can find some kind of compromise or some kind of solution that, you know, makes everybody happy and helps us all move forward positively. And of course, it's not always going to work out that way. But once again, at the end of the day, all we can do is the best for ourselves and, and you know, try not to let other people get us down. That's the thing about development. We're all at different levels and degrees of development, and that's okay, you know. The thing about that is that we never want to move down that ladder, you know. Don't, don't ever go down and seek to somebody else's level. You know, the point is to raise ourselves up and to try to raise that person up and even in that sometimes you know you will find that something you said did affect somebody and that was the motivation to help them uh, change and, and you know be more positive and serving in their life and uh, that's kind of where those like ideas of altruism come in because you may never see that seed that you plant in somebody else and uh, you know the, from an altruistic perspective, you don't need to see it. You don't need them to come back and be like, oh, Cora, I'm so glad that you, you know, opened my eyes about this issue now and, and you know, I'm really involved in it or, or whatever, you know, it's like that's not the point of altruism, you know, you don't look for rewards when you go out and help somebody else. Kind of a little complicated uh, there, but you know, that's all I'm saying is that you we plant the seeds in others and we may not always see that or you know we may think uh, something about somebody else's life and think that oh they always no matter how bad they do wrong they seem to always get rewarded or you know they do nothing and and life seems so great for them you know never really know what somebody else is going through and so we gotta take that in consideration with our attitudes too because once again we can go back to that Freudian projection thing, you know, and, and I definitely think that's true with anger. A lot of times we project our anger onto others for, you know, just really because they're there and it's kind of easy to do. And so uh, that's all I'm saying is, is the uh, counter argument to that is that we can also affect people in positive ways. But like I said, we don't always see those results. And that's okay if we don't always see those results. You know, we still have to do the best that we can. And then, of course, when it comes to looking at psychology and looking at all these different uh, traits and characteristics that we have, because we are a science and we're interested in that empirical data, we have ways to measure our attitudes and our beliefs and everything else like that. So when it comes to looking at just our general attitudes, it does come down to, you know, we usually uh, measure it with scales, you know, we like those in, uh, those questionnaires and then you put them on those scales and, and uh, to, look and pl uh, to look at that data there, right? So a lot of times uh, just uh, interviews, just asking people just, you know, to talk about how they feel about something. You know, just having an actual attitude scale, like I said, to where they fill out a questionnaire and, and kind of, you know, report how they feel about various issues. 
and then a uh, social distance scale so a lot of social psychology and just looking at how we get along in groups does have to do with proximity it does seem like uh, you know we're more willing to reach out to those that are closer to us than those that are farther away because it goes back to that in group and out group idea right you know those in our immediate area those are our in group you know whether we identify with everybody we live around or not that still you know those are the people that we live closest to and and so a lot of times you know people are going to you know once again conformity and we're going to see similar ideology at the same time though we we do have diversity in this world and that's one of the great things about the United States is that we have a lot of different cultures living here and so you know we have that exposure to that diversity because once again it's not a bad thing to have people different from us we actually want people to be different from us you know think about it you know just really sit back and think would you really be happier in life if you think everybody thought the same way you did and everybody acted the same way you did I just don't think well a as human beings it's hard to say if we'll actually ever be truly happy with anything right but uh, more importantly I would say that no we would not we would get very very bored very very quickly if we didn't have anything to challenge us in life you know so that's why not all conflict is bad not all diversity is bad you know it's something that we need we see that especially just in the natural world you know most ecosystems thrive when they have a bunch of different species that are working together and the good thing about us as human beings is that we're all one species but there are so many different ways for us to be human beings that you know when we have those those different cultures and those different individuals and those different mindsets and ideas working together you know that's where we are more creative and more innovative and then and, you know that helps us be more critical and uh, better problem solvers <clears throat> All right, so then uh, once again, when it comes to uh, our attitude and maybe ways that we can go about changing our attitudes, or a lot of times we don't like to use that word change, we say, oh, we don't like to change. So I like to say, look at it as improving our attitudes, you know, because it's all about working towards, you know, those, those paths of self actualization and trying to be the best human beings that we can and, and reaching those optimal levels of happiness and well being and we can't do that on our own you know we have to help build everybody up in that process too and uh, so th so you know who we engage with and how we engage with them definitely affects our attitude so when we see changes in our group membership and maybe you know what we call our reference group so basically that would be our uh, another way of saying our in group you know so when we see changes in that that you know that that's that's going to you know that's implementing something new so automatically there's going to be some type of change and once again it's how we respond to that change is what makes it positive or what makes it negative and a lot of times uh, the way that we go about changing our attitudes and the way we engage with others has to do with pers uh, persuasion and persuasion it's just a uh, persuasion is that uh, we're deliberately trying to change somebody's attitudes or beliefs and we do that through arguments and we do that with information now once again we have to be careful of persuasion because we can have infallible arguments and we can have misinformation so you know well that's why it's always important that we're kind of mindful of what we allow to influence us in life because you know sometimes people have nefarious intents the best thing I can think of would be like cults and cult leaders Jim Jones maybe you guys have heard of him he's one of the most famous Jim Jones was uh, famous in the 70s became this big cult leader had this huge following and took everybody down to a town in South America I can't remember 
where exactly they were, but uh, ended up, uh, they, they were kind of this uh, big religious group, and they had this idea of mass suicide. They were all going to, you know, it was like the world was going to end, and they were all going to go to heaven, and so basically, uh, Jim Jones, he put strychnine in everybody's Kool-Aid, and so they drank the uh, Kool-Aid, and then everybody died, and um, I don't know if you guys know how that affects your body, but you know, they basically they didn't die from the poisoning. You die because of what the poison does to your body. So once you take that strychnine and it starts seeping into your system, you start convulsing, you know, you go into seizures, you, you foam at the mouth, and it's just that, you know, you, you, you tend to uh, asphyxiate. You know, if you don't choke on your own vomit, you swallow your tongue or just, you know, your, your throat closes up. So very violent you know type of death involved and and the thing about Jim Jones is he gave everybody else the Kool-Aid but I'm pretty sure he didn't drink it himself which is typical of antisocial personalities and those people who become occult leaders you know they convince everybody else to do these things and eventually to kill themselves and then you know their narcissistic personality doesn't allow them to do that too so we really have to be careful when it comes to persuasion and whom we allow to persuade to persuade us all right, and then when it comes to looking at how we interact with people, you know, life is not black and white, but 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 so much of, of how we view the world is kind of in those black and white terminology, right? We're kind of doing it in this present in in this uh, lecture because we keep talking about how we engage others in, in these basic in groups and out groups, and we know that life is way more way more of a spectrum and varied than that. But then again, we do tend to keep ourselves in our little bubble. So, so that's just my challenge for you. You know, try to try to get out of your own little bubble and, and try something new. You know, if even if it's just like going to a local cultural festival you don't know anything about, or, or just you know going to a different kind of restaurant, or, or taking a different route to work, just implement some kind of little new thing in your life that maybe will affect, you know, and improve your attitude so that you are in more of those uh, positive kind of serving moods that will help you interact with others. You know, that'll help when you when you know, especially if you're going to go and deal with a difficult situation or a difficult person a lot of times in our work environments we, we tend to get in environments where we have maybe one or two toxic personalities that ruin it for everybody and you know that's a tricky one I'm like change jobs <laughs> but that's not always possible right you know you change jobs sometimes that toxic personality the way to cure it is uh, to, to report it to HR. I just did workplace training harassment last week, so that's all fresh on my mind there. But, you know, report it to HR. But it, my point is, is that even if you're in an environment that seems toxic, you know, there is a way to change it. You know, and the good thing about workplace environments is that if individuals don't want to change, they're going to have to if they want to stay there you know that's why we have things like HR departments it helps us you know it helps gives us that extra kick that maybe we're a little reluctant to do on our own right and so basically uh, uh, how this relates to assertiveness and this idea of aggression because it comes back to those ways of how we engage each other in those social settings and I think that you know when we look at social psychology we are talking about more the group setting so so when I hear social psychology it makes me think of how will we act when we're out in our work environments when we're you know at the gas station when we're driving down the road you know, when we're out grocery shopping, when we're in classrooms with each other, you know, those are our social environments. But we also have to think about those more personal family environments, too. So, you know, the way we engage each other out in society, you know, we should be engaging each other in positive and productive ways in our own families and in our own personal little bubbles when we come home at night too, right? Because that really sets the stage and definition. You know, my house, that's my sanctuary. That's where I get to come and get to relax and, and digest and kind of shake off all that other society stuff and, and you know, recharge myself for that next uh, uh, jump back into it the next day, right? 
And so when we come into our own little personal bubbles and, and environments, you know, it's really important of how we engage those closest to ourselves too because sometimes, you know, we can get in bad situations there. So that's kind of what I'm thinking like domestic um violence and assault type situations you know even in our own lives it's okay for us to be assertive and it's okay for us to stand up to aggression you know aggression is is really never something that we want to try to uh, project on to others you know once again life is not all unicorns and rainbows we're gonna get mad we're gonna get angry we're gonna feel aggressive at times that's just part of human nature it all comes down to learning how to channel and re-channel those energies and emotions into something that's actually not hurting somebody else just for the you know the, the hedonistic notion uh, or pleasure of you know hurting somebody else because it makes us feel good or we have that idea well i'm hurting so i want you to hurt too you know we, we tend to do that to each other as human beings or maybe not all of us or but you know we once again we have those patterns of behaviors in our societies and in our personal lives and so you know we just always want to uh, try to not be that way and if we find ourselves in too toxic of an environment where somebody's taking out too much aggression on us it's okay to get out of that environment you know especially for women you know women are definitely more victims of aggressive behavior and things like domestic assault and domestic violence and then you know Martin Siegelman kind of calls it a little bit of learned helplessness because we don't really know why some people get into that mindset in those types of situations and they think that it's their fault or they think that they can't get out of it and you know there is always a way out you know you can all if you can't change somebody else you can always change your situation too so uh, just just a little side disclaimer there because like I said as women you know a lot of times we don't reach out to others when we have those toxic home environments and it is okay to do that so that then leads us into these ideas of assertiveness and aggressiveness so assertiveness is different from aggression because you know once again with aggression you are intentionally wanting to hurt somebody else be it just mentally emotionally or physically you know the intent to harm is very apparent with assertiveness assertiveness though you're just standing up for yourself so I think of assertiveness is uh, you know it's okay to say no to people you know there's a way to say no but still be kind to people and and you know assertiveness it's being direct it's being firm it's being kind but it's it's standing up for yourself you know we don't always have to go with the flow the group's not always right and uh, just that it's okay to say no sometimes and you can say no to people and not be mean or aggressive you know sometimes saying no is actually the best way that you can help somebody else you know along their path so think about that <clears throat> All right, and so a lot of times, you know, we, we tend to, you know, it's in those direct confrontations, you know, someone's up in your face screaming and yelling at you and, and you know, you want to punch them, <laughs> but you know that's not the way that you really need to respond because, you know, it's when you're in those types of situations, you know, escalating them does nobody any good. And, and a lot of times, you know, it's not going to break out into that knockdown, drag out fight. It's just going to be a lot, of, a lot of yelling and screaming, maybe name calling. But uh, there is a way that you can kind of uh, break those kind of things up. Or even if it's just that, you're in a confrontation with somebody, your friend calls and they want you to help them move, you know, a common scenario here and they want to help them move and you know you're a nice person and you don't want to say no but uh you know maybe it's somebody that they always want something everybody knows that one person they always call and it's like oh goodness what do they want again you know that's another uh con type of confrontation you know that's not that negative aggressive confrontation but it's another confrontation anytime that somebody presents us with something that we're kind of uncomfortable with you know that is a confrontation and that is a time that we can be assertive so here let's and thinking about 
domestic assault and and then uh, you know thinking about these ideas like with the me too movement you know once again it's okay to say no and and be firm about it you know and uh, so that's what being assertive is so if you have problems with being assertive if you have problems with standing up for yourself there are some techniques that can help you to come more confident in yourself because that's really what assertive means it's the confidence in yourself and believing in what you say even and, and you know to the point that even if someone tells you no you know you still have that kind of moral conviction and then once again that's where you know it gets kind of uh, crazy too because you know then what if you're on the other end and, and you know you're the one that's being told no and that's what leads to that kind of domestic assault or a worse kind of confrontation you know if we're on that side of the battle that's when we need to learn that it's okay to be told no sometimes you know life is a learning and growing journey and we don't do that we don't self-actualize we don't find happiness and well-being by always getting what we want you know we're going to have conflict but in that you know we just want to make sure that uh, we are standing up for ourselves right and so there are uh, techniques that we can use to help us become more assertive rehearsing that's always a good way to do it you know figuring out what those uh, especially in business worlds or if you have to do a lot of presentations where you want to seem as an authoritarian and be taken seriously and respect it you know rehearsing is a good way to help you with uh, your confidence on presenting to others practicing in front of a mirror you know that's a good way to rehearse too and then just uh, acting it out you know if you have a friend that's willing to uh, you know role play with you then you know that's a great way to act out different situations and, and you know figure out those new ways of how to engage maybe those uh, those confrontations that you know we just don't want to have in life but we have to have sometimes right and then we and then uh, you know in learning to be more assertive we have to learn there's never too much or, or there's no such thing as overkill you know we can overlearn it's okay to overlearn we call that in uh, education we call that professional development because even after you go through and you get all your degrees you finally get to that stage of a PhD you're not done learning you know as the instructor we still have to take classes and have to go to college conferences and do all these other things and it's just all about that it's about trying to become that master maker you know it's learning how to master your skill and then realizing that that you still need to keep learning you know that's totally that that Maslowian um, uh, self-actualization theory and idea there right <clears throat> then uh, a good technique is this broken record and so you know this is another one we have to be a little careful with you know broken record is where you do repeat yourself until you get that desired effect a lot of it you know operant conditioning there you so think about like with the child you try to get your child to clean up their room get their teenager to take the trash out or something you know you, you want to you know you want to repeat the request and until it is acknowledged and then you know apply a little bit of that operant conditioning once they do what you want then you do that reward right they don't do what you want you apply that punishment but really with the broken record we're looking more towards the reward you know we want it to be a positive thing so that we don't have to keep keep repeating ourselves because with the broken record it's very easy to go into nagging and that's the thing you know once again assertive isn't you know it's not going into those kind of more negative aggressive behaviors it's learning how to say no and be firm and be kind about it and so you know you can you know please do this please do this please do this <laughs> hopefully you won't get to the point you know that it, it'll get heard before you have to snap and be like all right it's done taking the gloves off now all right um that little uh link that i have right there those are the discovering psychology videos they are actually done with dr zimbardo who did the uh famous stanford prison experiment that has a lot to do with these ideas of uh conformity and, and social psychology you know and how we engage others and 
how we view whom we should listen to or not. But anyway, he does. He's the one that hosts those. And uh, they're really good little series. And so uh, that one on social psychology is really good. I don't, I don't think you can link it. I'll make sure to put that in the comments section on YouTube so you guys can uh, go watch that if you like. I think it's maybe it's less than an hour. It's probably between 30, 40 something minutes. Pretty interesting. All right, so once again, just in thinking about how others, uh, how we engage others and how they uh, kind of influence us, we kind of look at those social influences. And so uh, we know that a lot of social influences comes in in those ideas of norms. You know, what are those social rules, those social expectations for a specific sense situation? Situation. So, you know, like if you go if you go into class and or, or say you go to church or, or just whatever pick any social scenario you guys can think of you know what do we do we kind of observe how other people act and then you know we tend to emulate how they act that's all a social learning theory right especially as some of the stuff that Bandera talked about and so we know that people are constantly influencing us and at the same time we are constantly in influencing others. So, you know, that's why we always want to try to set that positive example. And it's not so we could be like, hey, look at me. I'm so great and wonderful. It's really for our own mental peace and sanity. <clears throat> our own mental peace and sanity because I can't stress enough that you know when we act on those aggressive or negative emotions we're not hurting others more so than we're hurting ourselves you know and that's just something we never want to do right and so, uh, you know, we look at the way people influence us by thinking about those norms. And then we also look at that information. You know, as human beings, that, that that's kind of the big thing that makes us who we are. We process a lot of information, take in a lot of information. And, and you know, in that, it teaches us how we should behave, think, and feel, right? <clears throat> And then, uh, this is a funny thing, so uh, we see uh, people yawn, we tend to emulate that. Now that actually comes down to biology. We have these things called mirror nerve. Uh, um mirror neurons so you know it's like we can't help ourselves you know our brain you know as soon as we see somebody do that our brain just automatically does that neural connection kicks in and we do it too right and that's that's probably the biggest um, mirror neuron though but uh, smiling we tend to if someone smiles at us we smile back at them we tend to if we see so if we look at somebody and they frown what do we tend to do we tend to kind of take that same expression on you know a lot of that really is just kind of normal uh, biological reactions there and then once again some of it comes from those uh, those those norms that are set up and then a lot of it has to do with early development and the way that we formed attachments the way that our caregivers you know our parents our family members the way that they influenced and respond to us kind of sets the stage too for how we are going to interact with others and of course we see that in our personalities as well and so a lot of times when it comes to how we engage others we tend to confirm Form, and that's something that we learn very young in uh, development, you know, probably in our toddler years when we start to socialize with others. <clears throat> and so, uh, <coughs> once again, as social creatures, you know, we, we have a need to be around others and you know, we want to kind of behave in the same way because we kind of have that acceptance, you know. Once again, think back to Maslow and his hierarchy of need. We all want to feel safe, secure, loved, and feel like we belong. But conformity isn't always a good thing because, you know, sometimes we can go along with the flow even when the flow is wrong. So once again, let's look at things like stereotyping, prejudice, 
biases, things like uh, discrimination, so racism, not liking somebody because they're from a different religious group from you, not liking somebody because they have a different sexual orientation, you know. These are all things that at one point in, in, in our culture and in our society, it was okay. That was perfectly normal. You know, it was okay to not like somebody because their skin was black or their, you know, they were they were from the Middle East or, or from South America or, you know, whatever. It, you know, that was perfectly acceptable. And if you were alive at that point in society, you were expected to conform to those social ideas and those social expectations for your group. So if you were in the group... Uh, the, the majority that was, you know, um, uh, uh, the one setting down all these prejudice, racist ideas, you were expected to go along with that. If you were in the, the groups that were getting, you know, dumped on, you were kind of expected to stay in your place and act that way. So, you know, so, so conformity is not always a good thing. You know, that's one of those things like coercion and aggression start to come into play. Because, you know, once again... We want to be able to, to go out into society and engage each other in ways to where we're not harming each other, you know, we're not limiting, you know, we're not hindering or limiting anybody's self-efficacy or anybody's path to self-actualization, but we don't, you know, we, 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 we um, but we also, you know, have to agree that there are certain things that we can't do. And I guess that's, you know, that's kind of where it gets tricky at times because we have had these things in our past and so we still have them in society. And, and it's I think it comes down to, you know, we're trying to find those new ways to conform. And it's really not that difficult, you know, we can get along with each other that's you know once again that's ultimately how we grow in society but you know it just all comes to, but but you know on the more positive and productive side of conformity you know once again in order for societies to run and for all of us to get together we kind of have to have those similar ways of behaving and acting out in public and so when it comes to those ways that we act out in public the ways that we conform to uh, our culture and our and others expectations uh, we tend to see once again, break it down to that simple black and white view of life. We tend to break cultures up and to say they're either more individualistic or they're kind of more collective. And so, um, we often say that, uh, like Asian cultures, oh, they're more collective because, you know, they tend to live in bigger family units and they have more focus on traditions or, say, um, Hispanic cultures are more collective. And, and, you know, really, if you start thinking about that hard enough, you'll see that uh, American culture, Western society in general, we're unique because we are kind of the first culture that came up more of this individualistic ideas, you know, that... that um, self-determination right and uh, we, we kind of are taught to do you know to, to think more of ourselves more so than uh, you know the whole group and and so we say that we kind of overgeneralize and calling all these other uh, cultures collectivistic because it's just you know it's just it's a stereotype it's an overgeneralization so yes maybe Overall, if we look at Asian cultures, we can say that they tend to focus a little more on the family, on the group. But, you know, that's just a stereotype. That's why stereotypes are overgeneralizations because they're not looking at individual differences. You know, so let's go back to at the time when uh, society was, uh, you know, very racist and, you know, especially like here in the South when they had segregation, you know, there were those overgeneralizations going on, but even on that other side, think about those people who were in the majority, who were in the white group. I'm white. Think about the white people that were in that group that weren't prejudiced, but you know, but but they, you know, maybe couldn't stand up, or maybe they did, and they got in trouble for it. And, you know, so those people didn't want to be uh, stereotyped into being racist, just as much as you know the people who who are getting the brunt of those racial slurs don't want to be stereotyped by that way. So you see guys, it's all about just uh you know that that's the funny thing about the groups. Once again, 
we need these norms we need some point and we need some type of conformity so that we can get along with each other but you know it starts to to get complicated and when we add in conflict and we add in diversity because you know we want we, we want we have that sense of self-preservation we want to take care of ourselves but at the same time as human beings we don't live in isolation and we do need to learn more positive and productive ways of getting along with our diversity because you know I can't stress it enough it's our diversity is what is what has allowed us to grow it's our diversity is what has allowed us to have all these technological and innovative new things that we have and it's going to be our diversity that's going to help us evolve and overcome the conflicts and challenges that we are experiencing right now and that you know the next generation are experiencing you know it's all going to come from us learning how to work together and uh, you know social media TV may not seem, you know, sometimes it may seem like life is more negative and that we hate each other more than we like each other. But I just don't think that that's true overall. You know, once again, those are those political things that who knows why they do what they do. We don't talk politi uh, politics, right? We're in psychology. So, all right. So, so a lot of times when it comes to these ideas of conformity and how we're supposed to engage each other, you know, we have, uh, we obey because authority, because we feel like somebody with more experience, more education, more know-how, they are telling us to do something or it's because, you know, somebody is in a position of, of power authority that uh, we have been taught that we must give them respect to so think about it things like teachers things like a scientist you know they're all in positions of authority so we tend to listen more to what they tell us to do and uh, you know not always a bad thing but once again because uh, uh, you know we have uh, we have those, those tendencies towards negative behaviors in life we were you know we're just all about in psychology trying to understand why why you know it's all remember those four girls of psychology it's to predict explain control and and like uh, understand human behavior I totally paraphrase those those aren't quite the words you use but it's the same just there and so in looking at you know this ideas of why we choose to be obedient and in what situations we choose to obedi be obedient we see that authority plays a big role in it like we see with Zimbardo's uh, experiment with the Stanford at Stanford so basically um, he wanted to do an experiment they were just looking at uh, so so the whole point of the experiment at first was just to kind of assess prison situations it was just to look at how guards and prisoners interact with each other in those environments so that they can find ways to change those environments so during this time in the 70s you know prisons were way worse than they are now you know there's still a lot of reform that me needs to be made but you know back 30 40 40 something years ago they, it was a lot worse and so you know Zimbardo they were trying to figure that out yet the study turned into you know this whole um, this whole experiment on uh, obedience to authority right so what they did they took these college students and they put them in this mock prison setting they basically just used like the bottom floor of the psychology building there at Stanford and uh, basically it was supposed to go on I think for two weeks to a month I, I think it was at least two weeks the experiment was supposed to go on but not even within a day I mean within 24 hours pretty much everything went to hell the the uh, students that were in the roles of guards they really started uh, uh, you know taking their role seriously and so we see some abuse going on the, uh, the those college students that were in the prisoner roles they actually you know they, they duped them into really thinking that they had been arrested even though they knew they were in you know this bottom floor of, of, of the psychology building some of those kids you know really thought that they were in trouble really thought that they were arrested I mean within 24 hours um, one of them had or, or 
two or three days maybe like I said it didn't last even a week but within a couple of days you know the guards were doing abusive things to the prisoners the prisoners were rebelling you know there was one that actually had to be let go he kind of like had a nervous breakdown and, uh, and uh, you know, Zimbardo was really criticized because he actually let the abuse that the guards were enacting on the prisoners go on for as long as he did. It wasn't until another psychologist observed, um, I think as they were taking the prisoners to the bathroom and they had bags over their heads and they had them in like hand and, and foot shackles and they were all chained to each other and this... Uh, I can't remember her name, but it was a female uh, a doc, like colleague of his, and she was just mortified that uh, he was allowing that to go on. And so they kind of had to call it off because there was a lot of just emotional abuse and even physical abuse kind of going on there. They, those guards, they were kind of uh, set him up in sexual positions too. I don't think it was as bad as they did, if you guys remember back in the early 2000s there was that incident with a military prison over in the Middle East Agu, I'm going to butcher her name Abu Ghabi, I, I think is how you say it, but uh, that those those soldiers got in trouble because that's kind of what they were doing. They were taking those prisoners and they were putting them in all these humiliating uh, situations and just doing really humiliating things to them. And they even did like cross the line and did some sexually inappropriate things to those prisoners. Got in a lot of trouble for it, but it was kind of reminiscent and kind of a real world example here. 40 years later of this study that Zimbardo had done. So, so uh, you know, it, it just really taught us about uh, how uh, abuse of power is what it ended up being. And, you know, some of those, one guard, in one of those kids in particular did some really sick, sadistic things. And uh, if you see the, uh, the debriefing sessions afterwards and he said you know I was just doing what I thought that the guards acted I thought that's how they acted in prison so that's how I was behaving and, and so yeah kind of crazy stuff there the good thing about Zimbardo's experiment though is that uh, there were some major prison riots and, and you know it's kind of like unrelated but uh, there were some major, major prison riots that had happened to some of the most like San Quentin and uh, the other prison I always forget, but like two of the biggest prisons in the United States, they actually did, they, they like had some riots and, and prisoners demanding reform and based on what Zimbardo did with his studies, they actually, you know, did get uh, some uh, better prisoner rights, but like I said, there's still a lot of problems with the criminal justice system. But uh, once again, it helped us just to see how uh, people tend to abuse authority when they get into those positions, and then, you know, people tend to just obey because they feel like, because they've been socially taught to obey that authority. So it's very, very interesting there, right? You know, it really really have to uh, marinate on that to kind of understand, you know, why do some people tend to get very aggressive when uh, they get into positions of authority? Who knows? Um, <clears throat> I think it's called the Lucifer Effect since uh, Zimbardo's uh, study came out. It's actually pretty interesting to go look at uh, if you go to uh, the Stanford Prison I think it's just StanfordPrisonExperiment.com or, oh, I think it's .org, actually, to go look at that website and read up on his experiment and kind of the criticism that has come since then. So kind of the new ideas now that they have came out uh, uh, towards and Zimbardo and his experiment. Interesting stuff going on there. And then the other experiment that, you know, really uh, gets our head spinning because it's, it's you know, it's not this uh, abuse of authority. It's, it's on the other side of that now. It'd be like, why do we feel like uh, just because somebody has an authoritative position over us that we must do what they say? I can, uh, you know, once again go back to kind of thinking about the Me Too movement and, and uh, you know, place in incidences of like a workplace harassment and sexual harassment in the workplace, you know, sometime, you know, back in the 50s and 60s it was kind of normal, and be like, especially as a woman, if you wanted to move up the ladder in your job, you know, you had to do the boss a favor, and you know, there were probably a lot of women who went along with that because that was a boss. He was the one in charge, so she felt like she had to. That was society, that was society's expectation. That was 
way that was the way she had to conform so so just stop and think about that and be like okay so yeah conformity is not always a good thing and then once again people take advantage of it so let's look at it from the other side with Melgrim's experiment so basically with this he was looking at you know how far would people go you know what appeal to authority is too much you know if somebody's in a position of power over you where's the line what the, what can they tell you to do that you will stand up and go no I'm not going to do that and what Milgram found is that there's really not a line <laughs> that if people perceive you to be in charge of them they will basically do whatever you tell them to and so what he did they got a bunch of uh, you know we say normal people but you know they they got a, a group of people to participate in an experiment and in that experiment they were uh, told by the scientist or the teacher you know somebody in a white lab coat that looked all official had their clipboard and uh, I can't remember what they told him the experiment was about but you know it got into it like they told them on the other side of the wall there was a person that was hooked up to this uh, uh, to this uh, electroshock um, machine and uh, their job was to uh, you know turn the dial on that knob and deliver shocks to that person <clears throat> you know, and it was a way to, uh, it, it kind of operate, operate classical conditioning, like you shocked the person when they made a mistake, okay? And it got to the point, though, that they were told, okay, turn the dial up, turn the dial up, and, and, you know, they had somebody on the other side of the wall that was, like, talking and acting like, oh, that hurts, stop shocking me, saying things like that. And they got to the point to where most people, even when they told them to turn it all the way up, and it clearly sounded like the person on the other side of the wall was dying, you know, people still did it. And, and you know, at the end of the experiment, they found out, no, you really didn't kill that person, which, of course, a lot of people were really relieved because they were very upset that they went along with it and did it. But it was just that. It was like, okay, well, why did you do it? And it's, well, because they told me to, and they're the scientists, and I'm a part of this experiment, so I'm supposed to listen to them. So that's really interesting, isn't it, guys? It kind of makes you wonder, you know, if some... <laughs> It just makes you wonder, and goodness knows there are lots of horror movies out there that kind of exper that uh, you know experiment with these sides of human behavior. I mean, I, I guess the Saul movies, if you guys haven't ever seen those, those actually would be a really good example because in most of those mem movies, you have to do something to get yourself out of a bad situation, and a lot of time, it's you have to kill or do something bad to somebody else and that's kind of what's going on here too it's kind of a self preservation type thing it's like you know how willing are you how far are you willing to go to protect yourself even if it means detriment to somebody else especially if it's in a, if it's somebody who appears to be in a position of authority so that's some really heavy stuff to try to think about and consider because, you know, we sit there and say, oh, well, I, I think I'm like, I wouldn't have done that. Or, you know, even if they were an authority, uh, uh, you know, telling me, no, you must. Or, you know, I guess what's that? What did they do? Put a gun to your head if you didn't do it? You know, you got to think about those types of situations, too. It's like, you know, when do we draw the line? You know, when do we draw the line as listening to authority? And when do we draw the line as being those members of authority that are dictating to others what to do? And, you know, like I said, we really really don't know you know it's because you well know, once again we've been ingrained to think that if people are in charge that or you know they're the ones that are in charge they know what they're doing and so we must blindly follow them but at the same time you know when we look at how we engage others in society we have to you know we have to figure ourselves in it too so you know that's where how we view ourselves and our ideas of self-conflict come in so we have these things like group decision makings and uh, you know once again the group is not always going to be right but you know we have to be but we have to realize that uh, it's all contingent upon the situation and what is going on in that situation and you know it's always important to take that time to be mindful of what's going on that's one of the reasons why 
the good thing about our criminal justice system is that you know you, we do have those normal citizens who, who serve on, on that uh, jury panel right you know that's because you know we, we have to have a group of people to come together to kind of decide how the outcome of that trial is going to go you know and that's they take their time with that that was my point of that it's like you know that's not something that you do that's a rush decision you know you have somebody's life and you, you know this authority in over their life in your hands so you know that's something you definitely want to have group decision and kind of group think on and you don't want to rush into and so there there if you sit back and think there are probably many things in society that we tend to you know maybe rush into too quickly as a group a lot of times at work we get pressed because we're pressed for time and we have so much work to do so we may tend to you know make rash judgments or even with interacting with others we make those rash judgments and you know it's okay to take that time to, to stop and reflect and be mindful before we make any kind of action and I think we will learn that the more we can train ourselves to be mindful of our situations you know just once again guys it's not going to make you know conflict and stress go away but it's definitely going to help us relate and relax is the word I want to use and that is a good word and it will help us relax in those situations better so that you know we can handle them better and, and you know because that that's self-preservation you know not about hurting ourselves or hurting others I think in that time you guys have had time to read a little bit about what's that saying there and so then once again you know so in thinking about these ideas of conformity and obedience we also have to look at in the way we engage with others we didn't have that idea of peer pressure and it's just the way that others uh, influence us to conform and you know once again that's not always a good thing and we definitely see that probably in adolescence young adulthood when you know we're still and trying to find our sense of who we are and how we fit into the larger group you know we can be a little more persuaded to, to maybe do things that we're not quite comfortable with a uh, delinquent behavior would be one maybe a uh, sexual behaviors would be another one and then things like drinking and drugging those are probably a lot of things in our adolescence i think that we get peer pressured into and so you know we've got to be able to conform to the group but you know once again we want to keep our own sense of self our own sense of autonomy as i have written there and uh, we have to be able to discern what situations and groups we're in that are serving to us and going to help us along our path to self-actualization and which ones are maybe not so serving for us even if they seem like the fun way because you know that's the thing about trouble right trouble is packaged with a big old red bow that screams fun for the most part especially when we're adolescents right adolescence and the consequences in the criminal justice system aren't as severe as when we're adults right and so uh, so we just have to be able to you know once again take that time to be mindful in our lives and you know the best thing we can do for the younger generations is uh, a love them B realize that you know they're going to make mistakes and uh, you know C just try to uh, you know try to give them the best information that we can to help them you know not give in to the wrong kind of peer pressure because sometimes peer pressure can be a good thing you know think about maybe peer pressure to like learn how to do a sport or or maybe to like engage in a game i'm stuck in a childhood development guys that's a, in adolescence is what i'm thinking of maybe you don't know how to play like baseball or something and you're in a group of people and what could be the pressure oh play, come play with us come play with us come play with us and you're like okay we'll do that or you know maybe even something of in, in a collaborative like work environment of just trying to get everybody to uh you know have equal footing in, in a in a project you know there's some peer pressure maybe to to you know well tell us what you think give us your input you guys see what I'm saying? Not all peer pressure has to be a bad thing. But for the most part, I think when we do think about peer pressure, a lot of times it does lead to more of those 
a negative situation. So, you know, it's always important that we have a healthy sense of who we are, what we want in life, and where we are going along our path of development and uh, along, you know, as we move towards self-actualization and optimal happiness and well-being. And so really when it comes to our sense of self and ideas of self concepts, there are definitely um, a few different psychologists that talk about it, especially when we start talking about personality and development, you know, and all of that. We, we are the ego. We are in anthropology when you, when you do... Um, they're called uh, kinship units, so when you're describing how people relate to each other, ego is always you. It's, you know, that, that person you're interviewing. Ego is the one who is at the middle of all of it, explaining how everybody else relates to them. So when it comes to our sense of self, that, that's our ego. You know, we have to think of us first. You know, ego is not always the narcissistic, uh, uh, bad thing that, that we tend to, you know, mainstream society tends to uh, define ego as or term ego as. You know, it's just that healthy sense of self really is what we want. That That's kind of what Freud meant too. You know, our ego is our sense of self. It's how we act and we uh, just go about behaving in this world. So, you know, we have those that those unconscious side that, that largely affects us. And what's the biggest principle there? We have the id. So that we have that id part of our psyche and our unconscious, and that's that's kind of the bad one, you know. Think of the little devil and little angel. The id would be the devil because the id is the one that's like, hey, ego, go out and do that fun thing. Go out and do that. You know, it's it's going to be fun. You'll have fun in the moment. I'm very utilitarian because you're just or hedonistic to utilitarianism because it's all about you know explore, experiencing that pleasure in the moment that's kind of what our ego is is that that's why Freud said it's that pleasure principle and then once again that's not always bad we can find things that we that we think are pleasurable that aren't counterproductive or destructive right and then on the other side we have the angel that that would probably be where we take our our, our id and turn it into something more uh, self-serving and positive. Because the angel, that is the super ego. So that's the one that helps the ego, helps you go, mm, me, even though that sounds like a lot of fun, maybe that's not the best course of action. And so what do we have to do? Just like anything in life, we have to balance those aspects of our psyche out so that we make the most informed and just bestest decision for us, right? So Carl Rogers is really one uh, psychologist who uh, uh, I think that uh, his ideas of the self-concept and uh, regards to social psychology are probably most influential and uh, probably make the most sense for all of us. <clears throat> and so basically, Rogers, he came about after Maslow, so he's part of the humanistic school of thought in psychology. And you know with humanistic psychology, the general idea is that it, it's self-efficacy self-determination you know all people are basically good at nature society presents us with bad things and you know we act out sometimes but basically we're all good and we all are just trying to find you know we're all just trying to live life as happy and less stressful as we can and so you know we want to ultimately do good in life and, and there's like the analogy there you know just like that little seed you plant it wants lots of water and sun light so that it can grow into a beautiful flower we too as human beings want to grow into beautiful little flowers right and uh, you know and, and the thing for Rogers is the way that, you know, the way that we get everybody to grow in that beautiful little flower is with this idea of unconditional positive regard. Now, I know that's going, that, that's going to be hard because for us, you know, we've already been trained in these in-groups and out-groups. So, you know, if it's somebody in our in-group, it's going to be a lot easier for us to have that unconditional positive regard. Is that, you know, that means that... No matter what somebody else does, you know, you still love and accept that person. It's probably easier to think about it more in that parental relationship. You know, as a parent, you love your child unconditionally and you want to give them that positive regard. But, you know, of course, in that, 
you don't want to reward those negative behaviors, you know, but, but you still there's still that that level of understanding in you that nobody's perfect and we all make mistakes. So that's where the unconditional comes in. You know, we allow others to make their mistakes. And of course, once again, that gets tricky because when we go back to aggression and these ideas that there are people out there that just want to harm others, you know, how do we apply unconditional positive regard to everybody? And I don't know, guys. I can't really answer that question. And uh, all I could say is, once again, we start with ourselves and, uh, you know, especially those in our immediate influence. And then we just try to, you know, at least not limit it others. If there are people who are not in our in-group, but they're not doing anything to harm anybody, there's no reason for us to not give them the benefit of the doubt and apply that unconditional positive regard to them, too. Or if at least we can't do it unconditionally, we can at least try to do some positive regard because in you know a lot of times maybe um prejudice discrimination stereotyping it can once again it can be a type of a Freudian defense mechanism you know it's either something maybe in ourselves we don't want to work on or you know it's something that we've been taught so we're scared and we don't want to learn something new but you know once again we always have to keep ourselves open and then, you know, in keeping ourselves open and in thinking about how we give that unconditional positive regard to others, it's important that we maintain that unconditional positive regard for ourselves, you know. And so uh, that comes down to, uh, you know, how we form our self-concepts. -con what is our self-awareness and things like a self-esteem and then of course we know that all of that then affects our personalities and how we engage with others and so basically when it comes to this idea of self-awareness the old uh you know Descartes I uh I, I think therefore I know I exist right so where does that come into development and we just don't know we think that uh we think that babies do have some kind of self aware uh, some kind of awareness when they're in those uh, embryonic stages and, and you know when, when they're inside their mother's belly because we have evidence that they can hear their mother's voice we have evidence that maybe they can hear music and uh, maybe even have some kind of sight I don't know how that one works but anyway but uh but this idea of of where does self-awareness where does consciousness begin and does it begin in the womb and uh based on studies and looking at things like cognitive development like with Piaget um we do know that uh it seems to be that we start to become aware of ourselves about one years of age you know even a little bit before that maybe about uh, what about eight months of age we can recognize ourselves in a mirror we understand you know different people in our in ver uh, in our environments but it's more that that ego that I am my own autonomous entity you know and everything else exists around me that's kind of self-awareness we really don't get that until about one year of age and uh, at that point, probably up until about our or probably pre-adolescence there, pre-puberty, right? We, we have this idea that, you know, everything exists for us and around us, especially when, when we're in those infancy and toddler ages go. So definitely the way that that familiar environment, the social environment, the way that the caregivers, parents, and our siblings other family members interact with that child is going to affect their their awareness of self their ability to recognize self and their self concepts right and then that's an interesting statistic to say about one to two months that infants in Western culture have some awareness of own physical characteristics and capabilities I wouldn't limit that to just Western cultures and then it's probably about a preschool that we say we really start to get that self-concept that you know that's when as as individuals we start going well who am I what do I like and I think that and that really has to do with that socialization process you know 
about preschool, about five years, you know, kindergarten, this is when we're starting to come out of our, our familiar environments. This is when we're learning that the whole world does not just exist solely for our pleasure, that we have to share it with others and we have to be mindful of others. So what do kids start doing at that time? They start coming together, they start playing, and they start doing that. Well, who are you? What do you like? Do you like this? Do you like that? And then that's how people are, or that's how then we start to define who we are. And a lot of times we see when we're that young, you know, we tend to have overinflated ideas of who they are. <laughs> and a lot of times that may be contrary to what our culture says. So once again, we have these ideas that we're either a cultivistic culture to where we're more about working with the group or we have this individualistic culture, like I said, like with our Western culture, when we're more about competition and that's kind of the thing with our western culture we really have been brought up to believe that individual means we must compete with each other and it's not about individualism being that unique diversity that that helps us all move up and you know those once again are, are you know things that we have to kind of decide in our life how we want to manage that <clears throat> and so we see then uh, in developing an understanding of ourselves, we're also looking out to others. And so in thinking of who am I, how do I feel about things, what do I look like, what do I, what do I represent from my culture, we're also looking around at others and we're looking at and, you know, applying those things for them. And when it comes to looking at things like race and ethnicity, you know, we're not pre-programmed to hate each other or to hate somebody else because they look different from us. You know, that is something that comes from social ingrainment. But at the same time, as little kids and, and, you know, as human beings, we realize that we're not all the same. So, you know, so questions about racial, physical differences, ethnicity start to come out, you know, when we're in these preschooler age. And sometimes we see this thing called a race dissonance, and, and that is when we were seeing uh, minority children that will kind of um, identify more with uh, the majority situation. I think uh, using our culture probably from like the 50s to the 80s, where, you know, we think about it pretty dominated by uh, uh, just the one group, white culture. And so, uh, you know, you watch TV, you look at sports, you know, look at models, you know, whatever we were inundated with during those time periods, it was always, you know, a particular type of white person. And so we see that, you know, uh, uh, people from other uh, races or ethnicities, you know, in order to find their place in that dominant society, that they start taking on those types of characteristics and, you know. And, you know, and sometimes that can be a bad thing, too. And that kind of leads more into uh, maybe mental illness or types of mental disorders because you don't want to have a dissonance so much that you disconnect from who you are and your own identity that then you start thinking you're somebody else. Then you get into cultural appropriation and that's a, that's a subject for another lecture there. So just note that when we start to, you know, get to that point in our development, we're socializing with others, that, you know, we do start to look around. And the way to understand who we are, we kind of have to compare and contrast ourselves to others. And then, and, and you know, when we're, when we're that young, it's all more kind of, a, it is really a physical thing more so that, that we are focused on, you know, because that's all our little preschool brains can kind of conceive at that point in our life because that's kind of the, all the experience that we have, right? And so once we start moving along development and we start aging, you know, we get to about pre, you know, pre-pubrescence to puberty. And so then we start learning uh, or realizing that we have skills and that we are more than just our physical appearances. And so we start to view ourselves more than in terms of our ability. So we look at things we're good at, things we're not good at. And if you talk to 
I would say probably about seven, eight to ten year old kids, and you ask them, you know, who are you? And they probably say, oh, well, I'm, you know, I'm good at drawing or I'm good at, at playing baseball or, you know, that's how they define themselves based on the things that they know that they can do at that part. And a lot of times we do, you know, kids will put those self-concepts into kind of personal things and maybe academic. So it's like, well, I'm, I'm nice and helpful to, to other people. I, I, I share my dolls, I share my cookies, and then, you know, I'm good at baseball and sports. That's who I am, right? And then basically what we see is once we get to adolescence, um, you know, we, we are at a point to where we're trying to find a view of ourselves that, uh, you know, that, that, we're trying to find out who we are in context of the larger group and at the same time you know we are also at a point to where we're we're susceptible to what the larger group tells us who we are so you know that's one of that's that's when you know conformity starts to come in and that can really cause a confusion that can hurt our self-esteem that can hurt our self-efficacy and that can hurt our development, right? So, you know, it's especially during adolescence, we see girls are very, girls more so than boys are more vulnerable to having um, convoluted senses of self-concept. We actually see when it comes to uh, mental disorders, 32% of uh, adolescents and young adults suffer from uh, things like anxiety and depression. And it's something like, you know, in reported statistics, it's 60% of that are, are usually females. When it comes to looking at eating disorders, it's mostly females. And so, you know, my point to that is that, uh, you know, in thinking of these ideas of being human and how we, you know, need each other to get along as women, definitely, especially as girls, we can definitely learn to uh, be more supportive to each other, give each other that uh, more unconditional positive regard. But, you know, competition kind of uh, creates some of those problems too. So what do we see if we want to look at Erickson and his stages of development? We know we have this kind of identity uh, confusion stage here and that's where you know we're just uh, confused of who we are, where we're going in life, who other people say that we are, and just trying to fit that all together into one healthy sense of self can, can be very overwhelming and daunting, right? So we know we have these uh, social pressures, and uh, then Erickson said that, you know, we kind of have this psychological moratorium, and uh, it's kind of like where, where we like to explore different facets of adulthood. And so he kind of gets criticized for that because, uh, A, Right there, he said there are differences in genders when it comes to looking at how we form our ideas of self. And B, this idea of a psychological moratorium is a kind of elitist because, you know, when we look, cro when we look not across culture, not cross culturally, but I meant across, when we look at all of our Western culture here in the United States, just, just for example, and the different groups that make that up, not all of us are lucky enough to, to, you know, take time off once we graduate from high school and go take trips around Europe and find who we are, right? Some of us are poor and we have to automatically jump into the adult world and start surviving and providing for ourselves. So he gets a lot of criticism for that. I think that was... Um, <clears throat> oh, and then with uh, Marcia's... Um, a criticism about it there we actually see um, <clears throat> is that you know at some point we do even as adolescents and, and cross culturally we do all kind of a uh, try on various archetypes and roles in our life especially when we're in adolescence you know but uh, it's not um, but but it's just that it's just what I said guys that it's just a different way of saying it there it's just that you know we're not not all of us have the opera have the uh, financial or social economic opportunities to truly uh, you know explore all the different ways that we can be in life in adolescence or even in any stage of development right <clears throat> 
so for the most part though when it comes to our sense of self and uh, just who are our identities we, we usually say that by the age 18 which is you know supposed to be which is that chronological kind of definitive age that we note adulthood that, that by that time we have a strong sense of self and identity and that, once again, is something else that I would challenge because, you know, not all of us, and once again, we're all at different levels of development. So we can't say that when everybody turns 18, they're automatically an adult. I mean, for number one, our brains aren't de are not developed until in our mid-30s. And, uh, you know, emotions, we can't, we, we may make it to 80 and never develop emotionally or uh, emotional intelligently and so you know so we have to be careful with you know putting those definitive ages on to something but for the most part by the time we get to be adults a lot of us have a good sense of who we are and kind of how we may fit into the rest of the group and if not you know we do have the opportunity to explore that more but like I said not everybody does, but in some way, shape, or form, you know, we're always um, evaluating ourselves in comparison to others and, and, you know, always finding those new ways to uh, improve our views of self. So when it comes to looking at our views of how we view ourselves, we also have that social identity that we take on too. So, you know, basically what that means is how society views us and how others in society will view us based on who we are. So, you know, be it our nationality, our ethnicity, our race, our uh, sexual orientation, our religion, where we're at in society, what kind of job we have, you know, all of that is a part of our social identity that forms our self-concept too. And it just goes back to that idea of those in-groups and out-groups, you know, that, that we just really want to be careful with uh, whom we term to be in our out group because you know that's when we really get conflict coming up and so we see that with one of the famous experiments in the 50s called the robbers cave and so basically what we see as human beings is that really we start you know for the most part we do get along conflict comes into play when we have to compete for things mainly resources when we have to compete for resources and we have limited resources that's when things start to get tricky and hairy and uh, so with the robbers cave experiment basically back in the 50s they took these two groups of boys and all the boys were about the ages 10 to 12 so kind of prepubescent at the onslaught of puberty there they were all middle class white boys who kind of had the same you know they, they both had, grew up with the same type of belief systems same, same type of family structures same types of, of environments right so we already see the bias in this study but nonetheless and that's not the point. I'm just uh, giving you guys the background for this too, for, for this experiment. And so we see um, what they did is they took these groups of boys and that first they separated themselves and let the, none of the boys knew each other. Okay, so they separated them off into two groups weren't aware that there was another group that was out on this camp this boy scout camp that they were at and so they allowed them to take a few days and kind of form bonds with the other boys in their groups and so they did that and then they told them that there's another group that they had to start competing with and even before these boys saw and the other group, they were already setting up these ideas and expectations of what that group was going to be like. So they set it up as, you know, they were going to do some games. They were going to play tug of war, or pin the tail on the donkey, I don't know, just, just capture the flag, you know, just different types of games like that. And even before those two groups of boys had met each other and interacted with each other, they were already kind of is, is spewing off kind of negative and uh, ugly things about that other group and, and talking about their group more favoritively. And so once they get them out and together, they actually, uh, you know, another one of the experiments where all hell breaks loose. These boys kind of, they start fighting with each other. It gets to the point to where they're vandalizing things. They're burning up each other's property to where then, you know, the, the, uh, 
researchers actually had to step in and separate him, you know, and so they separated him and kind of let him cool off for a few days before they brought him back together and you know, they were still kind of conflict. But that's kind of what we saw with this experiment is that when it comes down to it, we don't, that, that you know, that those, here's what they learned with the experiment, that it seems like when it comes to competition, you know, that is a conflict. That's where we start, you know, once we're told, hey, there's somebody over here and they think they're better than you. And you're like, oh, no, they're not. Our group's going to kick their butts. You know, that's what these boys thought. And as we see when we have common goals, you know, it's those when you have to have goals that you're working on, but when we do it in a competitive way, that's when we start having a lot of conflict with each other, you know. And I would say that goes down to maybe a basic fear response because, you know, we don't want somebody else to come in and out survive us and and you know so so once again it's another experiment that uh, just teaches a little bit more about our social and ethical behavior and how we view each other and uh, who's really to say who's right or wrong with that you know I mean we have to survive but once again we have to find a way of surviving that that we all have mutual goals and you know that achievement of independent mutual goals reduced conflict that sounds like that that experiment um that that was the the result of the experiment that that we learned that when we can work together we don't have as much conflict that was not what was the result of the experiment we learned that you know when you put people pit people in groups against each other there's going to be a lot of conflict and and you know we dissipate that when we can get people to work together so if they got both of those groups I'm trying to think maybe the second part of the experiment they actually did get all those boys working together I can't remember now but but you know the point is is that when we work together more and, and when we you know learn to uh, expand our in-group uh, you know we don't have as much conflict in life and once again, that just goes back to, you know, why we don't want to stereotype because, you know, it's just that over exaggerations of differences between our group. And, you know, the reason we don't want to stereotype anybody is because, you know, that that affects people's views of self. It limits self-efficacy. It limits abil our ability to uh, self-actualize. And just like we don't want someone to stereotype and think a certain way about us, we don't want to do that to others. So it's always best to try to approach others and situations in a way that are positive and serving. And so wrapping it up, so once again we see that, uh, you know, it's early on in our childhood that we start developing that sense of our, our of ourself, you know, who we are, what we want to be, and how we really are in life. So we'll go back to just uh, Carl Rogers. So, you know, Carl Rogers thought that uh, basically when it comes to ourself, other social psychologists uh, um, emulate this uh, or, or uh, respouse respouse this idea too. They share this idea. That's what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to say it fancy. But, um, you know, we all have our, our view of who we are. We all have the view of who we want to be, and then we have that view of who society thinks we are, and then we can break it down to, you know, because the people you work with think that you, that think of you as being one way compared to, say, your family members who think of you as one way, and to people on the street that you meet that think of you as one way. You know, we have all these different ideas of who we are constantly inundating us. And, you know, our job is to, who's right? You know, which one of those versions of self do we agree with, you know? And basically with Rogers, he said that, you know, we have to come down to kind of this congruency. We have to take all those different views of ourselves and we have to, you know, we have to balance them out and in, into who we really are and of course in that who we want to be and who we think we are are the two most important parts of self for Rogers and I would agree with him on that you know when other people try to impress on you who you are or who you should be be mindful, consider it, but you know, don't conform to the point that you are making yourself miserable because you're trying to just uh, 
you know, please everybody else. Once again, we'll go back to the idea of assertiveness. It's okay to say no. It's okay to be told no. And, uh, you know, it's okay if not everybody always likes you. You know, the way that that we, uh, you know, find those levels of optimal happiness and well-being in our life is really by learning to give ourselves that unconditional positive regard. And so, you know, it's when we can take all those different things and, and, and balance them out. And like I said, you know, our idea of who we think we are and who we want to be, which of course is going to be the best versions of ourselves, those are always going to be more important than what other people say about who we are. Are. So, all right, guys, that wraps up our lecture on social psychology and our concept of the self. If you guys need anything, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Thanks. Bye.